Tonight we're in Psalm 65, 66, and 67. Let's begin reading together here in Psalm 65. And I'll read the psalm to you and we'll get into our study. Psalm 65, beginning at verse 1. This is a psalm of David. And David writes, beginning at verse 1, Praise is awaiting you, O God, in Zion. And to you the vow shall be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, you will provide atonement for them. Blessed is the man whom you, have, whom you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. By awesome deeds in righteousness, you will answer us, O God of our salvation. You who are the confidence of all the ends of the earth, and of the far-off seas, who established the mountains by his strength, being clothed with power, you who still the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples. They also who dwell in the farthest parts are afraid of your signs. You make the outgoings of the morning and evening rejoice. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its ridges abundantly, you settle its furrows, you make it soft with showers, you bless its growth, you crown the year with your goodness, and your paths drip with abundance. They drop on the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with, with flocks, the valleys also are covered with grain, they shout for joy, they also sing. This is what has been called a psalm of thanksgiving. And it's a psalm of thanksgiving because God has been good to His people. As we read this, we see how He has been good. He has been good because He hears their prayer. He is good to His people because He provides atonement for them. And He's good to His people because He exercises His power to care for them, and He provides for them in every way. And so, as the psalmist David writes, the first thing he wants to give to God is praise. So you see that in verse 1 where he says, "'Praise is awaiting you, O God, in Zion.'" And to you the vow shall be performed, O you who hear prayer. To you all flesh will come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, you will provide atonement for them. So David makes it clear that the people are ready and willing to give praise to God. Now, notice with me he speaks about praise awaiting God in Zion. Zion is another, is another way for uh, the city of Jerusalem. It's another way to call it uh, the city of Jerusalem. It's Zion or Mount Zion is the city of Jerusalem. So he's saying they're in... They're in Jerusalem waiting to perform their vows and make their offerings to God. Now, notice with me in verse 1, he says, To you the vow shall be performed. A vow is something that is voluntary. God in His Old Testament uh, law gave to the nation of Israel offerings that were mandatory, but He also gave to them the privilege of giving to Him a vow offering. And so the vow that He's speaking about is something that is voluntary and that is usually given because God has moved on their behalf and they're grateful to Him, and therefore they give to Him a vow or an offering that is a result of making a vow to God. The Bible tells us in Psalm 50, verse 14, offer to, offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. And so when God delivers us, when God does something on our behalf, very often we will say to Him, God, I am so grateful for what You've done and I want to do something in return. And so you give to Him an offering, and that's what David is speaking about right now. Notice with me that these people are gathering together. He says that praise is awaiting you, O God, in Zion. People are gathering together, and they're gathering together to praise the Lord because God has heard their prayer. That's what he says in verse 2 when he says, O you who hear prayer. We gather together to give you praise because we know that we can bring our needs to you and you listen to us. And therefore, we gather together with great joy, rejoicing in the fact that you have listened to us. And especially in light of the fact that we have asked you to forgive us of our sins. That's what he says when he says in verse, th uh, verse 3, you will provide atonement for them. We thank you, God, because you listen to us when we pray. We rejoice to know that when we lift our need to you, you not only hear us, but you respond, and you have provided for us atonement. You have caused us to have joy because when we are in sin, our sins weigh heavily upon us. And when our sin weighs heavily upon us, it creates in us a deep sorrow and a deep grief. 
And that sorrow and that grief comes because we've blown it, because we're in sin. And remember with me always that sin, though it may be pleasant for a season, always results in grief. It always does. It always will. Well, it's true that some sins are pleasant for a moment. Some things that you're doing you may be enjoying even as you're doing those things, but eventually those things do catch up with you. I was thinking about that just today, how as a younger man, you could never have convinced me of that. When I was 20, 21 years old, and not even 21, I was already saved, when I was 19, 20 years old, you could never have convinced me that eventually I would be paying for things, I would be suffering through things um, because I had been enjoying my life, I thought, and I'd been involved in sin. You could never have convinced me that, that I would regret some of the things that I was doing at that time or that I had done. But after I got saved, I began to realize that indeed I was reaping some of the consequences of the things that I had been doing. And anybody here who's lived a few years knows that eventually your sin does catch up to you. And it does cause you great sorrow in your heart. And it causes you great grief. The Bible tells us in Psalm 40, verses 12 and 13, innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I'm not even able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Sin causes great pain. Now, ultimately, God's provision for sin came perfectly through the death of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice that he says here in verse 3, you will provide atonement for them. God does provide atonement. Now, in the Old Testament, there is a, a system of sacrifices. So the nation of Israel had sacrifices that they would bring to the Lord. They would have blood offerings to God and all. And that would act as a, um, as a covering of the sin. But the fact is, is that these offerings had to re be repeated. They were not ever sufficient in and of themselves to completely deal with sin. And so in the giving of the sacrifice, there was always a remembrance of the fact that I'll be doing this again. In the New Testament, if you're taking notes, you might want to note Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4 through 10. In the New Testament, we're told that Jesus Christ is the perfect offering never to be offered a second time. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4 through 10, the writer said, It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when Jesus came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have no pleasure. I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. When Jesus Christ came, and it's very important because I want to point that out in verse 3 here, it says, you will provide atonement for them. That has a prophetic element to it in that God ultimately dealt with that by providing atonement through Jesus Christ. Sometimes we wonder why he came. One of the reasons that Jesus came was to be our atoning sacrifice. In his death on the cross and the shedding of his blood, he was able to deal with the question of sin one time for all time. So he never comes again to be put to death a second time. He was put to death that one time for all time. And so atonement has been provided. In the Old Testament, there was always a looking forward to the time that it would be perfectly done through a perfect sacrifice. In the New Testament, we look back at the sacrifice that has already been offered and rejoice over that. So Jesus Christ is the one that he's referring to prophetically. Jesus is the one who provides atonement. Now, in verse 4 of, of Psalm 65, continuing, he says this, Blessed is the man whom you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. The fact is, believers are intended by God to enjoy this life and the life to come. Sometimes we think about God who's going to be blessing us in heaven, but we fail to realize that God blesses us right now. 
God desires to provide blessings in my life on a daily basis. Now, you remember a few years ago when we were in Psalm 1? You want to turn there for just a moment? I, don't remind, I want to remind you of something found in Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the man whom you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple, that he may dwell in your courts. In Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. Whatever he does shall prosper. God wants to bless your life. And David is simply saying, I dwell in your house. I'm living in your home, and you provide for me from your own substance. You have for me a desire uh, of blessing. There's a desire that you have that you want to do on my behalf. That will be so incredible, I, I can hardly contain it. The psalmist in Psalm 1611 says, You show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. It would be like this. It would be like if you had a very wealthy relative. And say you come from a, a less than wealthy background and all, and you go to your, your relative's house for a vacation. As a matter of fact, you go there to live. And you're not used to walking up to a refrigerator that actually has food in it that's, that's, that's good. You're not used to laying your head on a pillow that is down. You're not used to using a, a, a shower that, that, that has 15 different settings on the shower head. You're not used to any of that. And now you've been invited to live with a rel relative, a wealthy relative, and you're, it just blows your mind. It just blows your mind because all that's there, he says, is yours. Everything I have belongs to you. And you come from one situation that you don't really have anything to, to really speak about, and now you're moved into a new location that everything that is there is provided for you abundantly by this very wealthy relative. When you got saved, God is doing a work in your life where he wants to bless you. So very often we don't realize that. So very often we don't understand that. So sometimes we get caught up saying, and I think rightfully so to some degree, that, that, that when we go to heaven, then at that point everything will be so substantially provided for us that we're going to have joy forevermore. But God says, listen, I want to bless you on earth too. Now immediately somebody says, are you teaching prosperity? Are you saying that, that you know, that we should uh, give to God, he'll give back a hundredfold to us? No, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, is that I have a God, a Father, who wants to bless me here and now as well as in heaven. And I have a father who wants to take care of me on a daily basis, and I should rejoice in that reality. I should rejoice in the fact that I have a God who says, I know you're hungry, therefore I'll take care of you. I know you need some clothing, therefore I'll take care of you. All you really need to do is seek the kingdom of God first and my righteousness, and, and these things will be provided for you. And that's all that David wants us to remember here. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts, that he'll leave his, his slum and move into a palace. God wants to bless you, and that's the point that David is making. The Bible in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I really think that the Lord has been trying to speak to my heart to remind me that he is a blessing God who wants to just take care of every one of our needs on a daily basis. I really believe that God is trying to teach me to just trust him in that area. And perhaps he's trying to teach the rest of us the same thing. Now, back in Psalm 65, continuing at verse 5, by awesome deeds in righteousness, you will answer us, O God of our salvation. You who are the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of the far-off seas, who establish the mountains by his strength, being clothed with power, you who still the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples, they also who dwell in the farthest parts are afraid of your signs. You make the outgoings in the morning and evening rejoice. Now, what you see here in verses 5 through 8 is God's power over nature revealing who he is. He is the God of all things. Now, I want you to notice something here in verse 7. Notice how it says, You who still the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples. 
Keep that in mind, please, and turn with me, all of us. Let's turn to Matthew for just a second. I want to show you something found in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8. God's power over nature reveals who He is. He is God, the Savior. If He's able to control nature, He's able to also take care of any circumstances in your life. And when God would do a work, and David is calling our remembrance of the fact that He is the God and powerful one over nature, it's intended to communicate to us something of who He is. Now, we have an interesting story in Matthew chapter 8 at verse 23 that I'd like to use to cross-reference. You see, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, we have a, a, an incident in the, in the ministry of Jesus Christ that is recorded by Matthew. He says in Matthew 8, 23, now, when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? In Jesus' command over nature, he's demonstrating that he has the ability, the power to protect and to save them. When the psalmist, back in Psalm 65, is speaking concerning his awesome deeds in righteousness and how God answers us, it's just another way of him saying that his control over nature demonstrates his ability to save you in any circumstance. And when God moves, and David's calling our attention to the fact that he does, when God moves, it's intended for you to know that he is all-powerful. If he's powerful enough to calm the sea, he is powerful enough to calm your heart because the storm that the disciples were watching caused fear in their heart. And very often it's easier for God to calm the storm that's outside than it is for Him to calm the storm that is inside. And so God will do the work, and that's what David is pointing to. God will calm nature down to demonstrate to you that He has the ability to control nature because He's the God of nature. And if He's the God of nature who controls the seas and storms and all of that, then He can also bring peace to a heart that is troubled. And David is reminding us that God doesn't do anything just because He wants to do it. He does what He does with purpose. And the purpose is for you to come to understand, for me to come to understand, that God is in control of everything. And God has the ability to calm a storm as well as calm my heart. Now, he goes on in verse 9 here in Psalm 65 to say, You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its ridges abundantly. You settle its furrows. You make it soft with showers. You bless its growth. Now, this is interesting. I want you to see this because you might miss it if you don't note it with me here. When he speaks about the river of God being full of water, when he speaks concerning the fact that God is providing water for the nation of Israel, it causes us to remember that in the Old Testament, part of God's blessings of the covenant that the nation of Israel has is the promise that he will provide for them water. He provides what is called the early and the latter rain. Now, to give you a little history to remind you, the nation of Israel was in bondage in, in Egypt for over 400 years. When God determined to, to set them free, when God determined to bring them out under the, under the deliverer Moses, God gave to them the law. And when God gave to them the law, He said to them something like this, and I'm paraphrasing, but He said something like this. He says, I'm taking you from a land that was basically uh, irrigated by the Nile River to a land that has no major water source. When you look at a map and you look at the Nile River, you see how immense it is, and you note that the, the Nile River provides water for Egypt. And so it was so important to the nation of Egypt that it was actually regarded as a god. God is saying, I'm taking you from a land that relied on the Nile River, and I'm bringing you to a land that doesn't have a major water source. When you go to Israel and you see the Jordan River, 
There are certain places or parts of the Jordan River that are so shallow you could almost, and so, so uh, you know, it's, it's so small, you could almost just leap from one side to the other. It's, it's just not a very large water source. And, and that river was never capable of being used for major irrigation in the nation. They couldn't use that water source. So what God said is this. He said, I'm going to give to you something. I'm going to give to you rain. I'm going to give you the early rain, and I'm going to give you the latter rain. When I give you the early and the latter rain, that is for your seasons so that you can have crops. And the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain your new wine and your oil. I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Now, here's something. I want you to see this because you'll miss this, and I want to develop this if I don't point this out to you. I want you to notice again, and I'm going to read this and point a couple things out that are very practical. When he says, you visit the earth and water it, you greatly enrich it. He's simply saying this, God, you have made a promise to us. That promise is found in the book of the law through Moses. You have said if we obey your word, if we obey your commands, that you will supply our needs. You have said you will cause the rain to fall, and in the rain falling upon us, it is an emblem of your grace. Jesus even spoke of that when he said God sends his rain on the just and the unjust alike. God's grace is there providing for even those who don't even recognize the reality of his grace. But I want you to note something else here. This is really important. He says, continuing in verse 9, you greatly enrich it. The river of water of God is full of water. You provide the grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its ridges abundantly, you settle its furrows, you make it soft with showers, you bless its growth. When he speaks of ridges and furrows, there are two ways that you look at that. One is the natural ridges and natural furrows that just occur through uh, normal circumstances. But also, it speaks of the men tilling the land and preparing, and it really gives to you a picture of man in faith, trusting God, preparing for the blessings, that God has stated that he would pour on them if they're faithful to him. And so what you have, and this is how it works in your life, in your Christian life, what you have is God and you cooperating with the plan of God through faith. God says, I will supply your need, but you rely on God. God says that you can do a work, but he says, but I will do that work through you. So man in faith cooperates with God. See, you don't just go and lay down and then the rain comes and suddenly a crop comes up. You go out and you till the ground. You go out and you plant the seed. You go out and do your part. And God provides his part. Your part is the labor. You do the planting. You do all of that and the harvesting. But it's God who provides the water. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, sometimes I've heard Christians say, well, my God shall supply all my need. And so they don't go looking for a job. They just kind of wait, and wait for God to send them a check in the mail, you know, love God, pay your rent, you know, that kind of thing. Sometimes the Lord does come through in that way, and we know that many of us probably in this room have been recipients of, of these acts of God's grace that blow our mind, and we weren't expecting something, but it came and, and all of that. But, but most of the time, the way that God supplies your need is he gives you the opportunity to work. You go out and you provide by using your hands and you, and you work with your back and the sweat of your brow. God opens the door for you to get the job, but you work the job. And there's a cooperation between the two. I can remember when I was a brand new Christian, the word was out that Jesus is coming back any time now. And we were looking forward to Jesus coming back. And, and some people were going out at that time, new Christians, and they heard that Jesus is coming back. And they had heard that there's going to be a system that is put up by a, a person that is called the Antichrist. And I knew of some people who were taking credit cards and they were starting to charge them up to leave the bill for the Antichrist. And I guess they're still paying them 30-some years later, those bills that they charged up. And that isn't what we're supposed to be doing. And so the bottom line is, and it's a very simple and very practical thing that I'm trying to point out here. David is simply saying this, God, through your word, you have made a promise. You have promised to water the ground. And you have promised that in that, that's a, that's a picture of the grace that we have from you that you will provide for us. But at the same time, 
we are acting in faith and trusting you. Therefore, we plant, we put our seeds down, knowing that the Jordan River cannot supply the water to pr produce the, the harvest. So in faith, we're trusting you to honor your word. We will go out and act on it, waiting for you to fulfill it. And that's Christianity for you. We go and act on what God has said, waiting for God to be good to his word. And that's what David is speaking about here. In verse 11, you crown the year with your goodness. Your paths drip with abundance. They drop on the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered with grain. They shout for joy. They also sing. And so finally, God intends to abundantly bless, and that's the point that he's making. Keep that in mind. One of the scriptures that the Lord gave to me is found in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, where God says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. I have a desire to bless you, and I know my plans for you. And if you fit within those plans, you will ultimately rejoice. That's what he's saying in verse 13 when he says, The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered with grain. They shout for joy. They also sing. I have a blessed plan for you, and I intend to bless you wonderfully. Psalm 66. This is an unknown psalmist. It's simply a song. Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Selah. Come and see the works of God. He is awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. There we will rejoice in him. He rules by his power forever. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. Selah. O oh, bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. For you, O oh God, have proved us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. I will go into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, which my lips have uttered, and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt sacrifices of fat animals with the sweet aroma of rams. I will offer bulls with goats. Selah. Come in here, all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. This is a song of praise, and we're praising God for the great things that he has done. And, and notice with me, he speaks about a joyful shout. So you're singing loudly because we honor his name when we do so. And you sing praises to God because that is something that is worthy of doing. The psalmist in Psalm 47, verse 1 says, Clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. When you go to Israel... And you're standing there outside the Western Wall, and if you're facing the Western Wall, it's very famous. Every one of us has seen it on the news if you haven't been there personally. And you're facing the Western Wall there, and you're looking towards it. It's actually divided into two sections. On the right side is, the court, is where the women are. On the left side is where the men go. And then the men go onto that left side there, and, and, and they worship the Lord in prayer. And the women go on the right side, and they worship the Lord in prayer. And it's been going on now for 2,000-plus years. Now, when we were there on one occasion, I remember hearing people as they were uh, beginning to make this loud noise, and, and there were these women who actually were raising their voice very high, and, and they were making this very shrill sound with their voice, and it almost sounded like when I was a kid growing up watching uh, cowboy movies, and you'd see, you know, the war between the uh, Native Americans and the, uh, and the cowboys and all, and you'd hear the, the, the war chants and, the, and all of that noise. It sounds very similar to that, and Pastor Chuck was with us, Chuck Smith, and I heard the women making a very loud noise, and I turned to Chuck, and I said, Pastor, what's going on? What's happening? How come they're shouting like that? And he says, well, the Scripture says, shout unto God. 
And he said, they're making a joyful noise. He said, that's what the Scripture's referring to. And it blew my mind because I'd never really thought about it that way. I was in, uh, in Los Angeles. I forget the year now. It's the last time the Dodgers won anything. It's like 89. <laughs> and I went to the first game of the World Series. Somebody in the church had tickets, and they took me to the World Series, the very first game. And I remember sitting there as, as the Dodgers were playing with, uh, against Oakland. And I was there that day that Eckersley threw that famous pitch that, that Kirk Gibson hit out of the park, and I was on the right field line. And when Gibson hit that ball, I still remember seeing it come off of his bat and travel past us and, and land in the uh, right field seats there. And the entire place erupted like I've never, I've never heard anything like that before. The noise was incredibly loud and continued going without cessation for over 20 minutes. It just continued this incredible cheering and cheering of multiple thousands of people. And then we left, and we climbed in the car, and, we, and that way it took us 15 minutes to get even to the place where we could drive out of the parking lot, and there were still shouts, and those were shouts of triumph. And I came to realize that, that, that people can, can be so excited over a home run that Kirk Gibson hits, then maybe it's okay for me to have joy in my heart for what God has done in my life. And that's what David is speaking about. It's amazing to me how the world would cheer for its, its, its movie stars and the world cheers for its athletes and the world cheers for so many, but then tells you to shut up when you praise the Lord, when you have something in your heart that God has done. And, and he's saying here, make a joyful shout to God all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name and make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Now, through the greatness of our power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you, sing praise to you. They shall sing praises to your name. And so he's saying we ought to have a heart that is glad in the things of the Lord. Notice in verse 4 how he says to us, all the earth shall worship you. Ultimately, this is fulfilled at the end of all things. All the earth ultimately does worship the Lord. In Psalm twenty-two twenty-seven, 27, the Bible says, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. In Revelation 15, 4, the Bible says, Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? You alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship before you. Your judgments have been manifested. And so he says this is something that the world will ultimately do when Jesus rules and reigns. Verse 5, come and see the works of God. He's awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. There we will rejoice in him. He rules... Uh, his, by his power forever, his eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. God's mighty works are intended to produce awe and praise from us. And by the way, and I want you to see this, when it says, come and see the works of God, he's awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. I really believe that one of the things that you can do that I think fulfills some of this, come and see the works of God, I think that some of this is fulfilled when you take the time and are given the opportunity and take the time to give your testimony of what God has done in your life. I remember many years ago now, it's been over 15 years, we were doing a, um, an Easter Sunday service, and we used to rent the Gardner Spring Auditorium in Ontario. And, um, you know, we'd fill it up a couple times on a Sunday morning for Easter. And somebody in our fellowship approached me and told me that an old high school friend of mine had been invited to Gardner Spring Auditorium for Easter services. And while they were there, and they weren't a Christian, while they were there, I came out to teach. And when I gave the message, at the end of it, my friend from our church, asked his friend that he had invited, what did you think? And the guy says, I can't listen to him. And the, the guy from our church said, why not? And the guy said, because I went to high school with him. I remember what he was like. He could not have changed that much. But the fact is, I had. 
I had radically been transformed. So much so that I can say along with, and so can you, I can say along with, with the psalmist, come and see the works of God. He's awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. God changes your life. It's not a religious thing that we have. You're not changed by, by ritual and religion. You're changed by the power of the Spirit who actually transforms you into a different person, a different person. And that's the truth. That's what God says he'll do. Oh, yes, of course, there are certain things that will always be part of your core personality that aren't going to change. But the essentials of you are transformed and you become entirely different. And it's not just because you grew up and outgrew your drinking and you outgrew your violence. and You, out you don't outgrow sin, guys. You refine it. The first time you lied, you got caught. If you didn't get caught, you must have been lying to another kid because if you lied to an adult, they saw right through it. I can remember I was about five years old, six years old at the latest. My brother took me to go play baseball. It was the very first time I can remember playing baseball. And we went to the school down the street from my house, and they pitched the ball to me. They gave me a bat, and they pitched the ball to me, and they said, you're supposed to use this stick here to hit that ball and then you run to that place there. And they're trying to teach me to play baseball. I was a little boy. I knew nothing about the game. And so I remember swinging at it. I hit the ball. It rolled maybe 12 feet, and I ran to first base. I came home really proud of myself, and I spoke to my mom. Now, you need to know that the school I went to actually butted up to the, the 5 freeway. And the 5 freeway from home plate was about 450 feet. So I told my mom, I played baseball today. And my mom said, really? I said, yeah. And she said, what did you do? I said, I hit the ball. She said, really? Yes. How'd that happen? He threw it at me, and I swung this stick, and I hit it. She goes, really? Then what? I said, and then it rolled. To, and then I started telling her exactly what happened. But my mom was so caught up with the story, I said, and then it went in the air. And, and then it went over their heads. And it landed on the freeway. I remember lying to my mother, telling her that. And it landed on the freeway. And my mother goes, it did? I said, it hit the cars. And she goes, it did? I just, you give me some room and I'll lie. Now my mom's smiling and she's thinking how sweet and cute and he's trying to impress me. But I learned later on how to lie and make you really believe that. You see, your sin, you know, the first time you stole something, if you ever stole, I'm speaking to maybe one or two of you who stole, the rest of you know people who did. <laughs> none of you ever took anything from Disneyland, right? I know none of you never, ever known. And you never lied, and you never stole, right? But anyway, the first time I stole, I got caught, but I got pretty good at it later on. I stole bird seed, and we didn't have a bird. I was five years old. It, it was a can. It was yellow, and it had a green parakeet on it. And for some reason, that was just the coolest thing that I had ever seen in my life. And I put it in my pocket. I went home. My mom was doing the wash, and she pulls out this can of bird seed, and she says, David, what is this? And I said, I don't know. I, must, I don't know how it got in there. And my mom marched me back to the market. It was called Shopper's Market. And marched me back to the market, and I had to tell the manager that I stole bird seed. But I got pretty good. <laughs> I got pretty good at stealing after that. You don't out, outgrow sin. You refine it. You actually get better. And so you have to actually repent from it. When you repent from it, God begins to do a work in your life, and he can magnificently transform you into somebody that is unrecognizable to those who know you best. And you can say, look at what God has done. Come and see the works of God. Look at what God has done in my life. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You become an entirely new person because Jesus said it's called being born again. You have a brand new life. That's why when somebody says, well, you know, I've been born again, but I'm still, you know, into dope, you know. So you're a born-again um, 
doper. Is that, yeah. Oh, okay. You know, or I'm still living with my girl. Oh, you're a born-again fornicator. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm still running with the gangs. Oh, you're a born-again gangster. I see. Well, that, that doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, Jesus said you're born again. That means you're different. And when God gets hold of your life and begins to transform you, you can have a testimony where you can say, come and see what God has done. Come and see. And so God's creation, God's work, the awesome works of God uh, are, are, are something to point to. So here he says in verse 6, he turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. And there we will rejoice in him. He rules by his power forever. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. Uh, God does tremendous works, and God shows how wonderful he is through the works that he does. And verse 8, O oh, bless our God, you peoples. Make the voice of his praise to be heard, who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. For you, O oh God, have proved us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You've caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. Bless our God. Make the voice of his praise to be heard. Why? Well, because God refines our faith through the things that we go through. Because through the trials and the afflictions that we encounter, instead of us losing faith, our faith is increased. Because God takes what was meant for evil and turns it around for good. Because God can take the deepest sorrow that you've ever experienced and actually develop character in you and patience in you and gentleness in you and awaken a joy in you and a peace that passes all understanding. Because God uses affliction, and by the way, that's what he's speaking about here when he says in verse 10, O oh God, you, O oh God, have proved us. You've refined us as silver is refined. How is silver refined? Silver is refined with fire. Fire in the Bible is a type of, of God's purging or testings. And so what God does is he allows refining fire into my life. And so when, when silver is refined and, and the impurities are being removed, it's due to the fact that it was brought to the point where it boils and the impurities that are inherent, that are within it, begin to filter up and then the silversmith can remove that and then he has a refined or a beautiful pure silver. And what God wants to do in our life, listen carefully, is to refine us. And he does that very often through affliction. And he does indeed do that through affliction. And what God does with that is he brings out in us the things that he's already invested in us so that we begin to trust him and express faith in him. And I've, I've discovered, as so have you, that uh, over time I thought that the trials would be lessened, but they're not. The trials actually seem to grow. Have you discovered that, or am I the only bad man here? <laughs> you know, God, God, God allows more and more into your life. And, and as he does so, it actually brings out more and more character in you. That's how character is formed, through affliction. That's how it works. I wonder how many of us have ever said something similar to this or even these words, God, make me like you. I want more of you. I want to be on fire. Well, <laughs> fire burns and it consumes. And when I say, make me like you, uh, Isaiah 53 tells me he was wounded. And so God has a way of, of breaking us. God has a way of taking the pride from us and making us dependent. And he does that through the afflictions of your life. Now, a believer recognizes the hand of God. And you know, some things look very, very cruel when they're occurring. I heard of, well, I'll give you a personal example. I was 14 years old and a man plunged a knife into my stomach. Ever tell you about that? Stabbed me right here and sliced me. And it went so deep into me, you know, just hit and sliced right through my stomach. I have a scar right here from him doing that. And my mom let him do it. He was a doctor. 
gotcha. <laughs> he was a doctor. And he took out my appendix. And it hurt. It hurt like crazy. When they gave me the anesthesia and they told me to count from 100 down, the girl said, you know, counting, I was getting, I was in the 80s, and she said, you're fighting it, you have to just let go. And I remember just going out underneath the anesthesia, but I remember waking up when the doctor said scalpel. I remember that, scalpel. And I, and I saw when they handed him the scalpel, and I saw him place it in my stomach, I was gone. Who needs anesthesia at that point, ma'am? <laughs> And he sliced me open, and my mother gave him permission to do that. <laughs> and then he sewed me up. But you know what? It did me good because he got rid of something in me that needed to come out, something that was deep in me, that was infected, that could have killed me. And you know what the Lord does? He's a surgeon, and he allows things into my life so that he can operate. And one of the things I've discovered is if you're going to be operated on, you better remain safe. Still. Don't jump up when the guy's got the knife in you. Don't do it. It's a bad idea. You lay as still as possible. If you're out, that's even better. Because if you move when he's operating, it's not going to work. You're not going to be successful. And you know what? When the Holy Spirit is operating in your life, don't be jumping off the operating table and saying, I'll be back later. Allow him to do the work. Allow him to finish the work. And when he begins the work, the Bible says that he continues it and he completes it. And so very often in your life, the things that you think are really hurting you the most are the things that are building you the strongest. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Because I, could, I don't want to start enumerating various things in my life, but I can tell you from a Christian perspective and from a personal testimony, I can tell you the things that I was most concerned about in my life that I knew I had no strength to combat are the things that God has used in my life to change me from what I was to what I am now. You know where compassion comes from? Compassion comes from suffering. Did you know that? Part of the way that compassion comes is when you go through something painful. Now you understand what that person's feeling because you've been there. Because you understand. Not that we all have to go through identical things, but when you go through some kind of pain, a loss, you know, and you go through that and it hurts, and then you encounter people who walk up and say, hey, all things work for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to His purpose. You know, step up our lip, we'll see you later. And you're still sitting there just like reeling. And there, you know, and it's, it's usually somebody who's not experienced any loss. They haven't experienced loss. Oh, your father went home to be with the Lord. You know, praise God, he's with Jesus. And you say, amen, but it still hurts. It still hurts. Yes, I know, bless the Lord. But my mom, you don't under, yeah, you know, where's your faith? Where's your faith? And then you begin to learn. Do you have a friend who walks up and says, you know, it hurts? Yeah. Now, let me give you one example, if you don't mind. When I lost my, when my father went home, I, he's not lost, I know where he is. When my father went home, <laughs> when my daddy went home to be with the Lord, Raul Reese called me up. He's a good friend of mine, as you all know. That's why I tease him. Raul called me at my house, and I answered the phone. You know, my dad had died a couple days before, a day before. Phone rings, you know, I answer the phone. Hello? And it's Raul. And Raul says, hi, David. And I said, Raul, my dad went home to be with the Lord. And Raul goes, I know. And you know what he did? He sat there on the phone, didn't say a word. Just sat there so that I could say how I felt. And his dad had gone home to be with the Lord, and he understood where I was at. Didn't have to say anything. Didn't have to throw a bunch of Bible verses on me. Gary Ruff, a dear friend of mine, same thing. Bob Grenier, they've all had their papas go home to be with the Lord. They've all lost their dads. And they were the ones who were of great comfort to me. And you know what? It, it built my faith. It strengthened me. And when you go through loss, when you go through pain, when you go through sorrow, it, it actually makes heaven a lot more, I guess, just more attractive to me. Because your treasures are in heaven, and they're not always substance. You know, our treasures in heaven may be relatives we love that we want to see someday. I mean, heaven is populated with those whom we love. And so God does works in you through afflictions. And, and that's what he's saying. He simply, the, the psalmist is saying, listen very carefully. You proved us. You refined us. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our back. You caused men to ride over our head. We went through fire and through water. We've been through it all. But, he goes on, you brought us out to rich fulfillment. 
all of this worked out to good. All of this did. On this uh, platform that I'm standing on right now, some of you already know this, most of you probably do, but before we put carpet on this, we had a day on a Saturday where I invited the church. If you want to come and you want to write a scripture, write your scripture down on the concrete because on Monday we're going to be putting our carpet down. And so we have hundreds, over a thousand scriptures, well over a thousand scriptures up here, right here, that the carpet is over. If we were to peel back the carpet, you would see scripture after scripture after scripture. And right in this area where I stand, I have my scripture. There's no other foundation laid uh, than the man Christ Jesus. I have that. I stand on that every time I teach. Some of you know that. Some of you don't. I wrote that right where I stand to remind myself every time I come here that Jesus is my sure foundation. You may not know that, but now you do. Right here. I wrote it right here. But my mom gave me a scripture for my dad and for her. Excuse me. It's Habakkuk 3:17 through 19. That's, I wrote her scripture right next to me. And it says... Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the field, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high heels. Not high heels, high hills. <laughs> I think of that because that's what the Lord does, you see. He brings us into conflicts to strengthen our ability to take those hills that are before us and to go up them and take them in His name. He gives us strength to do that. And that's what happens in afflictions. Anybody who ever has attempted to get into shape knows that when you first begin to work out, and you go home, and you might as well just die right then and there. I mean, I don't want to do this ever again. I hate this. I hate this. I remember when I was in the military, they made us run for miles. And I've never been a distance runner. I was a sprinter because it was a short race. You know, distance running, you've got to be kidding. But in the military, you have to run everywhere. In the airborne, you run everywhere. That's just the way it is. And so I had to build endurance. And I can tell you, the very first few weeks... I was just, I would complain, and I was upset, and I hated it. But eventually, running stopped being a chore. Running began to be something I loved doing. I enjoyed doing, because you get in shape. When you hit the weights, and you start firming up and all of that, at first your shoulders, your back, your chest, your stomach, your, everything is in such pain. But when you keep working out, after a while, it becomes something you just simply enjoy doing. It's even relaxing. Even your body even produces certain chemicals that give you a sense of euphoria. I mean, it's just a great thing. You enjoy it so much. But at first, it doesn't work. But in the breaking down, there's the building up. When you go through affliction... God is actually building you up, and you become strong. And that's why there are some people in your life that you'll say, that is a strong Christian. What made them strong? Well, he just told us. You proved us. You refined us. But you brought us to rich fulfillment. Verse 13, I will go into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, which my lips have uttered, and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt sacrifices of fat animals with the sweet aroma of rams. I'll offer bulls and goats. I'm thankful, he's saying, for your hand being upon me, and I give to you my gifts with great joy. I want you to notice something. The offering that he's referring to, that he says that he'll offer, give to the Lord, is a very costly offering. In verse 15, he speaks of rams, bulls, and goats. Those are costly offerings. You see, the law uh, gave you uh, permission to give um, uh, turtle doves or doves uh, if you were very poor. These are, are something that are very costly. The point he's simply making is, as I will give to you what you deserve. I will give to you the best that I have, not the least. There's an interesting scripture in Malachi in chapter 1, verse 8, where God is upset with the nation of Israel and the way they gave to him. And he says, when you offer the blind as sacrifice, is it not evil? When you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? 
Would he accept you favorably, saith the Lord of hosts? You don't give to God that which has no value to you. You give to God that which has value to you. And that's the point that he's making. I offer rams, bulls, and goats. Verse 16, come and hear all you who fear God. I will declare what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. The word extolled means exalted or lifted up. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear, but certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. He says, I want you all to know that at one time I was in trouble, but I want you to also know that I cried out to God and my God delivered me. Now, part of the reason why I had such confidence is because my heart was pure before God. Verse 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. My heart was pure before God. Sometimes people will cry out and say, how come God isn't answering this request and all? Well, it may be that the request is made with impure motives. It may be that we're living in a sinful situation and God wants to deal with that sin in order that the channel between him and I is, is opened up. Sin makes separation. If I regard iniquity in my heart, it's another way of saying if I prefer doing sinful things to having fellowship with God, then I have no relationship with him. Every married couple knows this, or every parent knows this. If, if there's a problem that you have with a child and that's an unresolved problem, then all you have is conflict and antagonism until somebody apologizes and re reconciliation occurs. Then your relationship is restored. But if you've got a problem with your husband or your wife and you go to bed angry and the next morning you wake up and it's still unresolved, you know that it's an unwise thing to put your head on the pillow at night if you're angry because you don't know what she's going to do in the middle of the night. I, rem <laughs> I had a lady in this church, uh, not in this church, a friend, who, who her husband came home, this is the truth, before they were saved. Her husband came home and he used to enjoy his wine and he came home and he was drunk and she, she's one of these ladies who had these giant, giant fingernails. I mean, giant fingernails, you know. And they were real. And, uh, I, and, and he came home, and he was drunk, and he plopped down on the bed. This is the truth. And, and she pulled the sheets back and dug into him with her fingernails, and he didn't get drunk anymore. And that was it. I mean, and you don't want to get some, you don't want to go to bed mad. You know, I know another girl who's planned, who planned to, to sew her husband up in the sheets. She was going to sew him up in the sheets and beat him up with a stick. <laughs> you don't want to go to bed mad. You have to deal with sin. And the Bible says, let not the sun set on your wrath. You have to deal with it that night. You deal with it and all of that. Why? Because sin makes separation. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. The sin has to be dealt with. And now ask yourself, this is, this is an important thing. I ask myself this as I pray. Is there something that I am placing before God, some little favorite sin that I have? And when I'm speaking to the Lord, am I regarding this higher than my fellowship with Him? That's something that you need to know. And there are times that you come before the Lord, and the first thing you do in your private time with God is you confess. God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. You know I've been angry at so-and-so, and I've been carrying a grudge for so long. Lord, forgive me because I have had these thoughts or these desires. You take it before the Lord because you need to deal with that as you approach God. But David is saying, I haven't been regarding iniquity. Therefore, I know God listens to me. Verse 19, certainly God has heard me. He's attended to the voice of my prayer. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 15, 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. And finally, he says in verse 20, Blessed be God, who has not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. And finally, Psalm 67. This is another psalm that has been written by an unknown author. <clears throat> he says, God, be merciful to us and bless us. And cause his face to shine upon us, <clears throat> Selah. And that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth, Selah. <clears throat> Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. 
and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. This obviously is Psalm looking for the time when God is going to rule over the earth and everything will be brought under his rule. This occurs naturally when Jesus rules and reigns. All he's asking for, though, and I want you to see this, is for God to be merciful. And he's asking God to bless and to show favor to them. And as God is merciful and as God does bless, the result will be praise. Not just from a few people, the result is going to be praise from the ends of the earth. Now, as God is merciful and as God is blessing and as God gives favor, this incites his missionary desires. Notice verse 2, he says, That your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Notice verse 7, God shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. If you want to be useful in sharing your faith, all you need to do is learn to thank God for what he's done. That's all you really need is fellowship with God. Now, I've been told that in my, in my um, messages, I've been told that I, I talk about my family a lot. I didn't know that. <clears throat> Seriously, never really thought about that. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What is natural for you comes out. You may not even realize to the degree that it's true. But I've had so many people over the years when I go to other states, and I enjoy doing that. I'll go to other states because we have radio ministry. So I'll go to to another place, New York or whatever, and, and as I'm there, it's so good because I get to walk amongst the people at the, at the radio rally, and they don't know who I am. They have no idea. All they know is David Rosales is coming from California, and they come to hear me, but they don't, they've never seen me before. And so they have all in their minds this, this, this picture of what David Rosales looks like, and they have no clue what I look like, you know, and so they just know that I'm Mexican-American. They know that. So they're expecting something different. So I will walk amongst them, and I enjoy myself. You know, I might talk to people. I'm kind of careful not to talk too much because they'll recognize my voice. And then I'll walk up, and they'll say, you know, let's welcome Pastor David from Calvary Chapel. And I walk up, and the people will look at you like, so that, oh, that's him. And I normally do this. I've done this so many times. I'll say, all right, do I look like what you thought I would look like? And you'll see them. They're, no, you don't. I say, okay, what you thought I would look like is this, right? You thought that I'd have black hair. You thought that I would have a darker complexion. You thought that I would have brown eyes. You thought that I would probably be a little bit shorter and a little bit bigger, <laughs> right? And, and you thought that I was very ugly. <laughs> and then I'll say, you've got me mixed up with raw. <laughs> But they always do. They always, because of my last name, they've got this mentality. And I say, what do you expect? You think I was going to come in with a serape and a sombrero and a burro, right? <laughs> That's what you thought. With a spray can, right? And autograph your Bible with that, right? We were all born with spray cans. That's <laughs> just part of what we get when we're born at the hospital. They wrap us up in a serape. They give me a spray can. They give me a wall, and they say, practice. <laughs> And it just blows my mind how God blesses. But you know what? They'll walk up to me and they'll say, how is Marie? And how are the kids? And I have them named Anna and Corinne and David and Joseph. How are they? And I'll say, you know my kids' names? Yeah, well, of course, Pastor. You mentioned them when you're teaching. <laughs> really? And Josiah, too? It just comes out. You see what I'm saying? So many people get caught up saying, oh, I don't know how to witness. You want to know something? When you fall in love with the Lord, it just comes out. It really does. It just comes out. It just does. When you're in love with the Lord. See, I'm in love with my family. You know that. It just comes out. I don't plan that. I don't have in my notes, mention Marie here, mention David. <laughs> And try and get Josiah in five times. I don't, I don't do that. 
It just comes out because God's work in my life happens to revolve around my relationships. I'm a very relational person. It comes out that way. When you have a relationship with Christ, you'll praise the Lord. You'll love him. You'll talk naturally about him. It isn't something that you have to, you know, sweat bullets. Oh, how am I going to get Jesus into this conversation? Oh, God, I don't know how. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You just open your heart and speak. So he says that your way may be known on the earth. Why are you saying that? Well, God is merciful to us. God be merciful to us. God bless us. God cause your face to shine upon us. And... As a result of your blessings, grace, and mercy in my life, I will be able to take this along with others, and this will be taken to the world. And so let the peoples praise you, O God. Let the people praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. You shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. God, as much as I, I, I love you and all, I'm also aware of the fact that ultimately you will judge. My responsibility is to take your word, your way of salvation to the world. But ultimately, you will judge the world for its evil, for its rejection of your son. But Lord, in verse 5, let all the people praise you, O God. Let the people praise you. The earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. And all the ends of the earth shall fear him. You see, sometimes people talk about missions, and if you ask somebody, what is the heart of, of missions, they'll, they'll say, well, to take the, the Word of God out to the world so that people might be saved, and, and indeed, that is part of missions. But you know what the heart of missions is? Very simply, the heart of missions is so that all people might honor, love, and glorify God. That is the heart of missions, that people will love and honor and glorify God. It's not simply the conversion of mankind. It is the praise that goes to God that motivates the missionary. Not just the conversion, thank God for it, of course, but there's a greater cause. The greater purpose is that God might be praised. And God is praised because God has been merciful to us and God has caused His face to shine upon us. God has given us peace and God should receive all of our praise. And when God has worked in us like that, then you tell other people, come and see what the Lord has done. Come and see what God can do when you just yield yourself to him.